BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. Hi guys, Peter Schmeichel here. I know that you've had my son on doing this, but I'm here to show you how to probably introduce a podcast. I'll be back with a question later, but first I've got to warn everybody that the following podcast will contain some strong language and adult themes. Enjoy. Crouchy P on the MIC. We're doing this just for free. Do you give it the sniff test? Peter, Peter, come do the quiz. Feel a little bit like Dirty Den. You and your two silly little mates. Silly little mates, just wrap it up. Is it weird doing one of these whilst wearing clothes? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be cruising at 2,400 feet. Let's free the ketchup. So much to get off my chest. And you've always had magnificent teeth. (laughs) How bad have things got? It's going downhill now, isn't it? The nation will be back stronger. Hello and welcome to another episode of That Peter Crouch Podcast with me, Peter Crouch, working from home again with Chris Stark and Tom Fordyce, right boys? Yeah, all good. Chris, you good? Yeah, I'm all good. Um, Crouchy, I've got to ask, I saw it was your anniversary, right? And then I saw you put something up at about eight o'clock on Twitter on your anniversary and I clicked the link and it was 15 minutes of Ronaldinho's best bits. So what the hell was going on? <laughs> yeah, we, we had a few drinks actually. So I just had a little leaf through and um, I was looking at Ronaldinho's best bits and I showed it to her and said, look, at you, even, even you can surely appreciate this man. What was her response? <laughs> I don't even know what you're showing me. Was the was the response? Yeah, so that's wonderful. So you're a few glasses of champagne in on your anniversary, and you've decided to whip out Ronaldinho's best bits to sort of impress her. Well, you know why not? I think I th- I just I was so taken aback by the 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 ability of the man. You know, I mean, it's it's something that I probably just take for granted how good he was. And um, when you put them all in clips like that, I thought it was worth showing. But I love that that's what Peter Crouch chooses to do on his anniversary night. I would never get away with it. I haven't said that. I, I did get a um, someone to come in and cook for us uh, after that. So I feel like I redeemed it a little bit. Mm. It, was a, it was a lovely evening. It was the perfect foreplay, wasn't it, to what was a lovely meal, I'm sure. I teased her in with Ronaldinho and finished it <laughs> And then the impre- impressed her with the <laughs> chef. Well played, mate. Boys, have we all seen the pictures of everyone enjoying the new favourite drink out there, the Laoot? It's gone big. I don't know if you saw this one. Did you see this one where they've actually got a can of Laoot? Mm. Has someone made it up just for this podcast? Or is there already a drink out there called the Laoot? Apparently they were in the process of making a stout and lager drink in a can and didn't have a name for it. Right. Believe it or not. Are they just lying? Possibly, yes. (laughs) Um, I've been taken in by people like this before. (laughs) I'm going to try. I've had a little look around the cupboard at home. I found one of these. Can you see that? A San Miguel. So I've I've stick that in a pint glass. I couldn't find a Guinness. You know, when you get random beers at the back of cupboards, got one here called Geordie Beer Geek. And it says it's a stout. So I'm going to put the lager in first. Was that the deal? What did you say the name of the stout was, Tom? Geordie Beer Geek. That's one of the trolls on the uh, on Twitter. That you're a troll, Jordy, Jordy Beer Geek, twenty four. <laughs> your pod Crouchy, shit. Your shit. Your football. Crouch, shit. Crouchy <laughs> shit, and your silly mates are worse. <laughs> Boy, it's great to have um, Peter Schmeichel asking a question. Do you think he would have a lout? Is he a lout drinker for you? I can't imagine him being a lout drinker. No, but um, I mean, what a ledge! I think he's the greatest goalkeeper we've ever had in the Premier League. No, goalkeepers don't often redefine goalkeeping do that we all know about the tricks whereas Schmeichel with that giant star shape he did which apparently came from handball didn't it he used to play handball incredible really was and he was the first one to sort of distribute the ball as quickly as he did you know run out run out of goal as quickly as he can and launch a throw and set up an attack he was ahead of his time he's a legend he for me was uh, the goalkeeper that made you want to wear the goalkeeper's top what happened to Royce and Sondico? They were goalkeepers st- staples. Yeah. It was the only goalkeepers wore them. And they used to have, they, like, you don't get this anymore, Crouchy. You used to take a little goalie bag with you into the net, didn't you? Like a, a little goalie handbag. Do they still do that? They, I've never I seen it. No, do. I don't think they do. They just take a water bottle now. Just a water bottle. What was bottle, in there? A spare yeah. pair of gloves. He used to take his little bag and a towel and he used to put, sometimes they'd, put, they'd even put the towel in the net. Yeah, that was nice. That's true. Schmeichel probably, like that. You're probably not allowed Little to do hand that wipe. now. 
There's probably a rule Why? that you can't have the towel on the net, surely. You know, there'll be young people here now going, what, they put a towel in the net? Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> well, they had, a, they had a little bag that they brought onto the pitch. What, what was and the they bag? Threw it, and they threw it in the goal. That's, that sounds ridiculous, but that, that used to happen. Right, boys, you got to see this. So I found in the cupboard behind me, I found two pairs of goalie gloves that I've had since I worked on Match Magazine. <laughs> these Sondico ones. Look at these beauties. Wow. Oh, now that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And then wait till you see this next set. They're still in their packet. They're massive Umbro goalie gloves, but you've got to see what the gadget is for this. So look, a little pot of sticky spray. Oh my God. What's that? Mega grip. Surely that's glue, isn't it? It's got full on cheating. cheating. (laughs) Shall I stick it on my hands? Shall I stick it on my hands and see how sticky it is? Wait. Hold on. Please. Get them, put them both, put them on either hand and put them both together, please. That is that is so sticky. Honestly, let me try and I can you can you hear that? Sounds a bit weird to be honest. With sounds you, sounds a bit <laughs> a bit dodgy that. <laughs> oh, then yeah. what are you doing with that a little stuff? pot of uh, Schmeichel's uh, glue there? Mega grip, man! It still works after twenty two years in a cupboard. That's madness. That I'm now holding my pint glass of Laoud purely <laughs> with mega grip. I can't get it out of my hand. He told me at the start of lockdown, right, <laughs> that I'd be watching Tom Fordyce <laughs> holding a pint of Laoot with mega grip. I don't think I'd, I don't think anyone would have believed you. Like, <laughs> what, what Tom's doing now is he's just testing everything and anything with the mega grip. <laughs> no, it, honestly, I can't get it off what my hands. Bizarre evening we're having. Crouch has done the robot again because it's 100 Premier Crouch. That Peter Crouch podcast from BBC Five Live. Right, welcome to our next guest on the pod. It's Theo Walcott. Hey uh, guys, how are you, mate? You I'm okay? Very well. Yeah, not too bad. How are the kids yeah. anyway? Have family well? Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, all good. Good. Been a bit intense. I've got four of them now. So, well done. Yeah. Well done. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. How's yours been? Yeah, no, they've been absolutely excellent. To be honest, at times I want to pull my hair out, and I've got a lot more hair than I had when I first met Crouchy, that's for sure. <laughs> Do you know um, what? I was going to say you're about 21 now. <laughs> like I was thinking you're young, you know what I mean? Because yeah. when I first met you, you were so young. 17 at a World Cup. I mean, how old are you now? <laughs> 31. <laughs> to be fair though, my body feels 21. Um, Do you? you still feel all yeah. right? Yeah, I've looked after myself. Like this sort of generation of athletes, you've got a sort of being top nick, I suppose. Um, but no, I'm yeah. 31. I've been around forever, it feels like. <laughs> Are you one of those people then that's just going to be eternally young? Because you're right, Crouchy. It's always, there was so much press around Theo being, you know, young superstar. I suppose a bit like Tom Daly is a similar thing, doesn't he? Yeah, good chat. Everyone assumes that he's really young, but he's about 50 now, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the thing about I like actually to be honest. There's a lot of people still call me. They just call me Theo. I don't call me say Walcott like on commentary type thing. They won't say Walcott. They say Theo, and that's stuck with. There's not many players they commentate as cool players from the first name, so it's actually kind of a nice thing. But yeah, I've actually been around forever, and um, but I've I've loved every minute. <laughs> I remember myself as a 17 year old. I was nowhere. I was nowhere near the Premier League. I was nowhere near playing for England. Um, you know, I just wasn't on that radar, and I was I was still. I'm in an orange whether I'd even have a career in football, you know? So, so to be called up, I don't think I would have been, I don't know how I would have dealt with that. How did you cope? Or do you think it helped or hindered your career? I would say a bit of both. You know, as a 17-year-old, you feel like now, you look at some players that come through and normally around about 20, 23, and they're classed as young and can develop in the background type thing. I had to grow up pretty fast, pretty quickly in a sort of man's game. And to feel like you're not part of this because you're not even playing the Prem. And so you're constantly there thinking, what am I doing here? Like, type thing. It was like that. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember me having um, my camcorder? And I was constantly film any rubbish throughout the whole my time. So I was a bit like a bit like a tourist, to be fair. I always I've, remember that, <laughs> honestly, because I've mentioned this before. I, every time I look, have you, have you still got this footage? Yeah, honestly, it's the strangest thing. I've only watched it like a couple of times, but. Um, just seeing myself really just a young just a young boy just at a World Cup like just a dream really isn't it um, 
And that, that's what it felt like. Just a dream. It really did. Mm. But I, because I always remember, like, I remember having lunch and things like that. And you would just go past with the camcorder. <laughs> what is the thing I was doing here? Yeah, I know. Well, I know. Amazing footage to have. I just didn't think of it, like, at the time. But as a 17 year old, like you say, I mean, most 17 year olds, what are they doing? You know, they're at school, just finished your GCSEs, and you're. At a World Cup, it's it's mind blowing, really. And like you say, you hadn't yet played in the Premier League, so yeah, you know, for that to happen to you so young, I don't know how you cope with it, really. And as well, I had the the other thing going on in the background back home, like Mel, obviously being with her very young as well. I had paparazzi following her. Um, I remember um, at my village in Compton, the whole village had flags up with "Well done, Theo!" "Come on, Theo!" England flags, and paparazzi wanted to get a picture of me and Mel together for the first mm. time. Um, since the announcement and all the village actually surrounded this paparazzi car because me and Mel just wow. wanted to go out just wanted to go out and have a meal together with the family in a way so no one knew where we were it was mad but it's great because all the villagers are like well you're gonna have to run us over if you want to <laughs> if you want to get through us wow. I'll, n- I'll never forget that um <laughs> so that meal actually was one of the, the meals I'll never forget because it meant a lot the whole village. Um, it wasn't just me going to World Cup. It was like the village going there as well. I'm really intrigued by this camcorder footage yeah. that you've got. What sort of stuff did you manage oh. to capture? This is this is surely the world's most sought after documentary that's never been out. <laughs> yeah, now. the one bit I remember is after I don't know what game it was, but I was I was actually interviewing Rio Ferdinand. Just interviewing him after a game on the back of the coach. I'm just spun round with the camcorder and just sort of shoved it in his face type thing. But yeah, I remember just, that's one particular thing that since stands in my mind with, with filming um, Rio. But yeah, it's, it's scary. It's on EC as I'm so young. So young. 31's young still. Still young. Well, it is, mate. Yeah, it is. When did you retire, by the way? Just so I know. I retired last year, 38. Okay, I've got seven years. <laughs> I yeah, want to beat mate. that. <laughs> seven years. There's not many other situations, are there, in life, thinking about what it must have been like for you at 17. Cause you, and you were only just 17, weren't you? You were only 17 and what, a couple of months old when you made your English yeah. debut? Um, it was against Hungary, wasn't it? At the Medeski, was it? When I, yeah, when I made one my warm up game. It, it was the B game, wasn't it? Yeah. And my first um, football match I actually went to go watch was at the Medeski. So that was another personal thing to me. Um, I remember watching Jamaica, Australia, and I had a Jamaican flag printed on my back of my head. No, nice. I mean I've had I've had so many stupid haircuts at times, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was um, it's never that's never faded away from me as well. So that's in the memory banks. But it's a strange one, really, because there's not many other situations in life, Chris, are there, where a 17 year old kid is suddenly hanging out with 28 year olds and 30 year olds and having to behave like an equal. That just doesn't happen. It is an unusual one. And I suppose you two must have been able to bond over your love of, say, Leisure World in Southampton and places like that, right? <laughs> Crouchy, you've told us some amazing stories about your times there. I'm mm. sure, Theo, you must have done the same. What do you remember about that, Crouchy? I remember um, student nights, uh, <laughs> hot shots, the odd cinema trip. Jumping jacks. Jumping jacks. You were probably far too young for all of this, weren't you? I was a cinema on ASK. That was me. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. Oh so that's a mad one, Theo. So if with that age gap, you how do you celebrate when you're, say, at these tournaments or at these matches with with players like Crouchy? And they can go out and they can go and celebrate and have a few drinks. What do you do when you're seventeen, eighteen? Fake ID? <laughs> um, I don't really recall going out. I don't know if you remember that at all, Crouch. I mean, you I, I invited, left, I Theo. Just, yeah, Theo can't come. He's too young. He's he's in bed at eight. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's but, full. It's full lockdown with England. It's hard. You have to just yeah. have a few beers in the in the hotel, especially yeah. where we were in Baden Baden. It was the hotel was just in the middle of absolute the top of a mountain. We had the barbecue at the end. I think my old man put his finger in it. He uh, he said, "Oh God, I can't believe Sen didn't play my son." Type thing. He's happened to speak to Sen's son. Um, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I was like, oh, my God. oh God, well done. That's that's me done. Um, <laughs> but no, it was um, no, that was it was really cool. I enjoyed it, and it, and then obviously going to the next England camps was a lot easier for me. Obviously, it was with Capello as well, wasn't it? Um, and I, hmm. you know, we, I mean, we, I think I remember seeing him on a golf course, and I remember this as well from you, Crouchy. Actually, it was in, I think it was in Switzerland where's the golf course on one of the hotels we were playing at because uh, it brought back the memory banks when I went um, with Everton to um, a pre-season camp. And I was like, I remember this place. 
I remember Crouchy <laughs> and Joe Hart absolutely going down the hill on the buggies. Do you remember? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> nearly killing Joe Hart, basically. Or it might have been used nearly falling out, honestly. It yeah, was- I fell out, yeah. It was actually me and Glenn Johnson, but I think Hardy was in our group as well. It was a big, steep hill, and it said keep to the path on the hill, and we just thought, oh, don't, don't worry about that. So we went down, and it was a wet day. We slammed on, and you only slam on, and it's like fully slammed, and we pinged down this hill. I'm not joking. We were spinning. <laughs> I jumped out of the cart. Um, it was bashing me on the way down, and then it just slid all the way across the green. I remember that it was like a there was a huge wheel mark for the green. It was a top yeah. course as well. Oh. I was, yeah, that was a, that was a low point. So, what was Sven like when you when he when he tells you you're being picked, Theo? The classic of the genre is that you don't believe it's Sven. You know, that's always the story, isn't it? I remember uh, like Arsen was saying that Sven was going to come watch training, and look, I feel like he just wants to see potentially maybe the future type thing. And I didn't really think much of it. I really didn't. And I obviously didn't get any experience in the Premier League up to that point. And then I happened to just literally see the Sky Sports type thing with my name pop up. And then I eventually really? had the fu- and then I eventually had the sort of message. You sort of get a text message, really. It's just a text message saying you're like in the thirty or whatever. And then I was like, oh my god! And I looked at the TV screen and I was like, I was with my dad at M- in Enfield, and I just had to turn it off, turn the TV off, just for because there was all sorts of people saying things and, and rightly entitled to their opinion. Obviously I'm, a, I'm 17. I've not played the Prem. I know like now looking at it back and I'm like, I, mean, I shouldn't have been there hundred percent, but I just had to turn it off because I just didn't want to see what people were saying. Or... As in the bad stuff, people, the, the critical stuff. Yeah. There's no need to get negative straight away. You know, I'm a positive person. I always feel like you need to go into anything positively and I ended up playing World Cup Monopoly with the old man. <laughs> Did um, you? Yeah, it was, it was very, <laughs> very What a way long. to celebrate. <laughs> Theo, you speak about managers there. What what about the first time that Arson got in touch with you? Do you remember that first call or text message? Was it in French? What did he do to try and impress <laughs> you? Because everyone wanted you. I got an invite round um, to his house in Totteridge. Very nice, by the way, um, with David Dean. <laughs> and I'm with my dad and with my mum. And I'm sitting in the room and Arsen, I, I suppose Crouchy a little bit like, you know, when you sit on a sofa and it's a bit too low for you and then you, your knees are above your, your face type thing. Because Wenger's a very tall guy and he looks so uncomfortable sat in his own house. And I thought this was very strange. <laughs> <laughs> it was really weird. But, <laughs> so that always stuck with me because I looked, he doesn't look comfortable sat there. I don't know why I, I thought that. And we, anyway, we had, um, it was just some food and we just chatted just about sort of the academy and just the club itself a little bit it was quite overwhelming for for me to actually take it all in I probably quizzed my dad after and just said can you just sort of dumb that down for me a little bit maybe um that was literally the day before I signed actually because I stayed in the hotel opposite and I, I this is where I had to buy I didn't have any clothes on me I didn't have anything on me and I had to go across to the retail park the night before <laughs> to buy my horrendous shirt I wore on the signing on day, which was too baggy wow. for me. And yeah, I got a lot of stick for that shirt, especially from a lot of my friends. Um, yeah, <laughs> and it was literally, it uh, basically was telling me how the day was going to work, you know, because I already sort of, a, you know, sort of handshake agreement. And um, yeah, that was basically it. Did he did he see you uh, going straight into the first team? So let me get, you're, you're 16 now, yeah? So you, you're, yeah. you're sitting down with David Dean, who's running the football club, and Arsene Wenger at 16. Mm. And they're yeah. talking about signing, and they're talking about your plans in the first team already I mean that's, that's just mind-blowing I just think about where I was at 16 and it, I'll tell you what it wasn't there right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah like because obviously I was I wasn't old enough to sign a professional contract so oh so what do they what do they try and get you with Theo is it is it like a PlayStation and but like what do they try and get a 16 year old you know like what do they offer you all he had to do is just say to you, you'll be with Thierry and retraining. And I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Um, yeah. No, um, I can't quite remember the whole logistics of it all, but it wasn't straightforward. It was not at all. And not just that, it was when I left Southampton and had no contact with anyone and people sort of knew I was going to leave, but I couldn't, I didn't tell anyone. I had to lie and just say, oh, no, I'm sort of, I'm not feeling great, blah, blah, blah. And it's just, oh, I hate. Really? Um, yeah, I had to tell my, all the academy guys and the teammates, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing great. So it was really difficult to, I mean, you would know, like when players leave clubs, it's the weirdest thing. Players come and they go and you, you've known them for three, four years and then they're just gone like that. And you're like, oh, bloody hell. 
Was there a part of you that thought, I'm like, I'm in the first team here at Southampton. Um, you look at Arsenal's team and think, you know, I'm not going to get the chances. And maybe, was there any part of you that thought maybe I could stay here and develop? Like before um, I went to Southampton, I was got shown around like Chelsea and stuff like that. And it was just too, it was too much for me. I was only 10, uh, 11. Went into Chelsea and I went into, I was the ball boy and I went into the locker room and saw all these players and Zola and all these players. And wow, I had a picture of Jamie Redknapp actually, which I'm, I uh, still got uh, TT Camera, like was, they were playing Liverpool anyway. And I just thought, this isn't for me. Southampton just showed me the academy side of things and nothing involved in first team, especially at 11. You don't even think of that at all. But when I made you know 23, I think, appearance of Southampton in the first team and scored quite a few goals, and I just thought, yeah, there was a few other teams that came in for me, but I just thought, there's a chance to work with one of the best teams, the best team in, you know, in the country at the time one of the best players in the world, one of my idols as well. Just an opportunity I couldn't miss out. And I wouldn't change it at all. I wouldn't change anything I'd done up to now. Nothing. What was the first thing you said to Thierry Henry? So you you, you love him as a player. You've grown up watching him, probably thinking, I quite fancy being that sort of player. And then you're standing next to him. Probably didn't say anything, to be fair. <laughs> as a picture of me with him, and I just looked starstruck, which you know you'd expect. Um, and I sort of, after years and years of playing, I reenact that picture and did it again, and just it looks like yeah, it's just just me and Thierry type thing. Theo, how was he with you? No, he's great because I mean, he used to uh, later on it got he used to call me Lewis. He used to shout Lewis very loudly, mm-hmm. and I just I'll be like, oh no, it's, it's Thierry. He's, he wants me. I'm Lewis Hamilton, the reference to that, looking like him, and I was like, oh god. Um, so that stuck with me, and at times <laughs> it was quite uncomfortable, especially the initial stages because um, I was very new and he just shout Lewis, and I'm like, oh bloody hell, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, don't, I just want to do my bit. I just want to stay under the radar, train, just that's it. Don't, don't be doing, pointing me out less. But I think he wanted me to just come up and shell a bit more and just be a bit more comfortable around the place. And so that, that definitely did help. But not just that, I remember him training against Ashley after training. He always used to grab him and just say, look, and he just 1v1s type things with him. And he would always tell him, well, I'm going to do this. And Ashley would never tackle him. Um, he was just so powerful. It was unbelievable to watch in, you know, up close. Um, and I, yeah, it's, I've always taken little bits from what he's done. But he's, uh, as a man as well, around the place, the way he talks to people, the staff, and you see his engagement in people um, as well. He's always, he always had a lot of time for people, which is really, really nice. You, you said about wanting to be under the radar. Like, I would think you'd want to do anything you can to kind of get yourself seen. When I go, go under the radar, I mean, I want to play and express myself on the football side of things, not be one of those who's loud in the dressing room. Like, that's not me. That's not my sort of style. That's not how I sort of approach things. I would rather do... You see, that's what comes across. What, be loud in the dressing room? Well, no, because you always come across... you And like in this as well, you come across so nice. Like, I can't imagine you ever having oh, offended yeah, anyone. Have you ever sort of offended anyone? I have. I have. I've had the odd incident with Pat Rice at times. The odd time he would get under my skin, and there was one time I, uh, I just reacted, and you know I think it's uh, you would know you know actually when like the times when you you're not playing for for whatever reason there's stuff going on oh. or whatever, you just want to get on with your job and try and get back in the team. Simple as that. But the odd small thing might just upset you, and yeah, I reacted. I reacted in a way which wasn't pleasant, but in a way it brought us closer. What happened with Pat Rice then? What was what 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 went on? Just think of it as a. You know, if someone makes a very bad tackle in a training session and then, or in a game, and then the whole team sort of react and sort of confront the, the culprit type thing, um, that was the sort of thing with Pat, what happened, <laughs> which wasn't a free kick. It's just a uh-huh. stupid thing in a training game. It's not a free kick. And then I end up reacting in a way where it's not me, but it just happened to be that day. Um, it must have been the way I woke up that day from bed, I suppose. I don't know. I remember at Stoke, um, Eddie and Zwicky, I always felt so sorry for him because Eddie would try and take a session. We're all trying to kick lumps out of each other. And then if he makes the wrong decision, everyone just tears into him because everyone's just angry <laughs> and frustrated. And um, oh, it's, 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 there's nothing worse than being the assistant in that in that kind of scenario. So I, obviously I get exactly where Theo's coming from there. Poor old Pat Rice <laughs> took, the, yeah. uh, took the brunt of it. Sure. That is correct. So Carlo Ancelotti, Theo, right? From the outside, he looks like one of the most fascinating managers to work with because clearly he was a great player. He speaks four languages. He's a great chef, apparently, as well. I don't know if he's a great chef. I've not had my invite. He knows his wine very well. That's for sure. That was one of the first sort of questions he asked 
but he's, you know, there's uh, quite a lot of similarities to Arsene. He's got that personal touch where he would take time to talk to a player and take him aside and just talk about anything. Really. It doesn't have to be football-based. It can just be anything. But he's, uh, he's got presence as well that like you want to listen. Do you know, I had, a, I had an amazing experience with Carlo Ancelotti. I played in David Beckham's UNICEF game at Old Trafford. We were in the hotel beforehand and uh, a lot of people had left. And um, Carlo Ancelotti, Alex Ferguson, myself, John Terry, and I think it was Ashley Cole, were still left in, sort of having a cup of tea. And then they started talking about old sort of Champions League stories and wow. facing each other. And, and I was sitting there going, I, I mean, <laughs> Alex Ferguson and Carlo Ancelotti just talking about, and John Terry's, you know, getting in there and talking, they were talking about Chelsea and what happened there. And it was so interesting, so interesting. And um, you know, think about the tales that those two men have got. And he, seemed, and he seemed like a top man for you, like a real top man. Like, I, I don't know, obviously, you, you know, he's your manager at the moment. It might be slightly different, but he just seemed like a top man. And all the Chelsea boys absolutely loved him. Yeah, that's exactly it. He's a top man. I mean, there was about five seconds I didn't like him when he brought up the um, the 10-1 Arsenal thing, when he, I think, back in the day when he was at Bayern. <laughs> Um, but then I liked him after that. You, you brought up the Champions League games. Like you scored in that game, didn't you? I was like, yeah, yeah. We lost ten two. I think an ankle bit. But cheers for reminding me. <laughs> like you say, he is a top man. The players want to do well, and for him, but not you know for the club, obviously, but for him particularly because he's he's really passionate what he does. You've been sort of in the south your whole life. Grew up around near Southampton. Played for Southampton. Moved to Arsenal for ten years or however long you were there. How have you found Liverpool? Yeah, it's it's different, but until you take that leap of faith, you don't know. You don't know like what's around the corner. Like again, we're quite privileged where we can go to these different places and see these, you know, be in a dressing room with all these different cultures and learn things. And, you know, being at Arsenal, yeah, so twelve, twelve years, I think, yeah. And people forget you just you leave in the club, you've been there for twelve years. You don't just up and leave like that and it's it's all happy day type thing. I had to leave Mel and the kids down south and she had to pack up the house on her own built up loads of shit for 12 years and I mean I'm quite happy I didn't have to help with that. <laughs> <So> I... <laughs> Mate, I was the same I was the same I said babe look I'm moving I've got to go you know we've got yeah. trading tomorrow let me know how you get on <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah go, like and as well I I had to to get my stuff from Arsenal in at night time get them in a the bin bag put all my stuff in a bin bag type thing Wow. And yeah, and 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 leave like that. It's, it's not you know you've been at a club for twelve years to leave like that. It's just a bit, it's a bit different. It's it? so weird. It's not... You've been like you say you've been at a club for twelve years, and you you know the big, huge thing about when you sign, and then you just get a bin bag. You throw all your boots in it. <laughs> yeah, you do. You, you just have to. And you, and you leave through the back door. It's the weirdest thing. And then you think. God, the canteen girls, the you know yes. the secretary, the people on reception, you know the the groundsmen. You're just never going to see them again. It's the weirdest yeah. thing. I, I'm quite lucky. I've been able to keep in touch with quite a few people down south, which is really nice. Um, it doesn't happen really anywhere else at times, but you know it's it's the way it is. Hey Theo, you said you've got no regrets, um, but what's this? I've heard that you were meant to be in a Harry Potter film. <laughs> And then you bottled it or didn't do it or something. <laughs> Surely, huge regret. Do you know what? Training got in the bloody way, you know. Um, my um, my uncle, David Yates, um, he has filmed the last three Harry Potter films and I got asked to be an extra in it. And maybe you can be in a Quidditch type thing. Oh, on right. the... oh yeah, I know. I was like, oh. oh my God. I mean, do you know what? My, my mum, my dad, my brother and Mel got in a film, but I didn't get in a film. I was gutted oh. for football. Football got in the way. Really? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to be on the one of those broomsticks and you know Quidditch. And <laughs> you'd be a great Quidditch player. You I'd fancy you at Quidditch. Oh yeah, I think you'd oh. get the snitch every time, wouldn't you, with your speed? I'd be after the golden snitch. Yeah. He'd love it, wouldn't he? He'd get. But, that. Yeah, that yeah. was honestly. <laughs> I just snitch. said to him, I know, <laughs> but um, I would have loved to have been in it. Walcott's after the golden snitch. Everyone, <laughs> do you know? What? Maybe, maybe I'll be an actor. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I might be able to act. I went to Harry Potter World, uh, the one in the Hertfordshire. Have you ever been there? Yeah, I've, I've got sort of my ties. I've He's got, got some like, connections, yeah. <laughs> get to show him around to certain <laughs> things. Theo <laughs> wasn't in the queues. Scenes and... my, in all honesty, Ab did uh, a dance there for Strictly in the big hall. So I was just down there watching her with my little girl. And then one of the fellas said, do you want to come around and have a look at the... Whatever it is. I'm not a big Harry Potter fan, as you can imagine. <laughs> 
<laughs> Come and have a look at the weather. Like it's, 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 it's quite awkward now all of a sudden. Uh, sorry, mate. <laughs> No, it's Theo's <laughs> uncle's work you're talking about here, Crashing. <laughs> Sorry, no, he's been 10 years of life on these films. It was directed impeccably. I thought, it was, <laughs> I thought it was a masterclass in directing. But anyway, I walked round, and um, the most impressive thing was the, the cauldron with the, what, was they, what are they called? What's in the middle of it? A wand, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was just going round on its own. I thought that was incredible. Do you know what? what that's brought me, that's brought me on something. I went to on set. And we're in a, this big sort of scene where they're in like a, a court case type thing. And Colin Farrell's there. And I'm like, oh, it's Colin Farrell type thing. And my son Finley comes in and the whole place goes quiet. And I'm like, and he's got a wand and he's like doing this to all the, all the wizards and stuff like pew, pew, <laughs> doing all this. And I was like, and all the, all the people were like doing this. And I just thought that it's going to stay in my head. From seeing my kid just pretend he's a wizard and doing all this to all these actors. Colin Farrell was like, that's just little things like that would mean so touch. much um it's Very a great good, touch yeah, really good, good. Cool. really lucky really that's lucky sick. theo when you next when you next go past the defender you got to mutter a little spell like one of those speedy spells that they get and yeah i'll tell you what my my next though, or whatever i'll it is. do some sort of wizardry sort of one yeah, give us a one <laughs> <for> you, <Crouchy. laughs> i'll be mate i'll pass the pod give us the one pass the pod <laughs> yeah everyone's gonna be looking out for the wand that's class <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, we always say this. Any way that anyone can pass the pod, Theo, you've got the next big challenge here. Next goal. Everyone's going to be watching, waiting for you to do the wand. It's got to happen. I will try my best, but it won't be as good as Crouchy's robot. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, we, we weren't expecting miracles, you know what I mean? I mean, that's, this, that won't be beat. It's great. And everyone, everyone in the crowd as well will give you the wand back. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> It'll be an amazing Wow. <laughs> Special. Sounds good. Sounds Theo, good. Thank, honestly, mate, thanks so much for coming on. It's been, I could talk to you all day, but um, it's been really interesting and uh, great to catch up, mate. Yeah, no, definitely good. No, really, really nice to chat to you guys as well. Definitely. Yeah, cheers, Theo. Oh, Top man. Cheers, guys. That Peter Crouch podcast from BBC Five Live. Hello again, Peter Schmeigel here. I'd like to know if Crouchy could spend a month of his life as another sportsman, adopting every part of their being. <laughs> Who would he pick? <laughs> what a question. question. I think about the, the sports that I like. Like I'm, I grew up playing tennis. I love tennis. Um, and golf now I'm obsessed with so I think to be I mean I'm just not a good golfer so to be a good golfer would be would be a dream and I think about the you know being on the tour they're always they just follow the sun round um which golfer though you, you know, can't you can't just be a generic golfer you've got to be a specific golfer no I think I'd be Rory McIlroy yeah I think he lives in Florida I think he mm. lives around the corner from Michael Jordan I think that'd be a nice place to live being one of the best golfers in the world, I know it's an intense sport, mentally so tough as well. But imagine being good at golf and going around the world and playing that in the sun. I think, Chris, that yes, it would be for Crouchy, it'd be amazing to be able to hit a golf ball like Rory McIlroy. But when you then, after the month is up and you return to being Peter Crouch and Peter Crouch's body, does the memory of being that good at golf haunt you when you go back to the golf course and you play as Peter Crouch? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Changes Jesus the rules Christ. again. These, I love the, these I love questions. questions. <laughs> Us, honestly, the, the, the discussions. We have one question. <laughs> we have one question. It was quite an innocent question. Now you're telling me that I have to go back to my skill set after I've been McElroy. Yeah. Oh, well, that would be so disheartening. You've enjoyed team sports. Like, what are your fears then of going into a sport where it's all just on you? Do you think you'd get found out a bit more? No, no, I'd, I'd, I'd relish that. I'd love it. I, I think the other person, right, I've got two people in mind. One's McElroy and one is Federer. I think being Federer, like, elegant, it's beautiful. It's a delight to watch. one um, in backhands. Oh, it's just, it's sexual in lots of ways. You know, if you were at Wimbledon in those whites and you win it again and caress the ball around the court and then, you know, you go and play play the US Open or, you know, you're, you're in Australia, you're playing, you know, we're all around the world, same, similar sort of vibe, you know, following the sun round, 
Am I right in thinking, Tom, that Federer receives a cow for every win that he gets? It's something like that, isn't it? Um, there might be something at the Swiss Open where it might be he has Swiss got some, Open. Yeah, he has got some cows, and I think fundamentally, Chris, the point you're making is that in his current residence in Switzerland, there's no issue having cows. But yeah. if he, if Crouchy was Federer, Abby's kicking off. Yeah, there's a cow outside, Peter. Stop! Stop winning tournaments, or. Maybe, because the thing about cows is they are quite useful. You get fresh milk every morning, sell it to Abby like that. We don't need the milkman. There's no popping out to Sainsbury's to get milk. We just pop out and and milk the milk cow. (laughs) How's Abby going to take that? But hold on a minute. This is another different spin on. So so Federer's me. Okay, yeah, yeah. Why is he with Abby? We're sort of breaking away. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, slightly. (laughs) I'm slightly concerned about Federer being, being me. I like, think so. No. Is that the rule that you sw- do you do a total swap? Like, well, no, it wasn't like a swap, Friday. was it? No, the question was quite simple. It's wife swap <laughs> it didn't with involve, Federer. It didn't. It didn't involve Federer <laughs> being with Abby at any point. It was never discussed. The question was quite yeah. simply: Would you like to be a different sportsman? No, <laughs> but what Schmeichel no, meant was: Would you Federer like was not Abby sleeping with Abby? Federer Abby. was never sleeping with Abby. <laughs> No, but what we're what I'm saying is, we're just a debate, really. But I, maybe this is what Schmeichel meant. Yeah, listen, I, th- I felt like we've over overcomplicated that question a touch. I've got visions of Federer and Abby that I, I don't need to be having before bed. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tricky this bit of the podcast because we always we finish this, we finish our drinks, we finish the podcast, then we go up to bed, right? You have to go upstairs now and lovingly get into bed next to Abby, but you will be thinking of Federer and that's what I love about this thank you Peter Schmeichel (laughs) (laughs) shit (laughs) will be as well also what you've got to consider here is that Roger Federer may be asked the same question do you think Roger Federer would if he could swap with any sportsman would he swap with you I think not because he's the greatest tennis player that's ever lived I think there's some aspects of it that he might enjoy. Okay, but name name something that you have that Roger Federer would want. A hugely successful podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Well played, Tom. <laughs> well played. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> I have to say, this is a strange evening we're having here, but... Um, serious, serious discussion now. Uh, where are we with the Ians? Any young Ians out there? <laughs> yeah, well, we've had a message from Gordy. I've got an Ian in my family who's only nine years old. Wow. Apparently he's named Ian just in case he wasn't great at spelling when he grew up. <laughs> oh my God. So limited aspirations for young Ian there. <laughs> Lads, we got this message from Matthew. Uh, it says, my girlfriend Alice and I are expecting our first child, a boy. And I'm very much up for a baby Ian. Uh, This would hopefully cement his place as the UK's youngest. Yes, this is a great idea. However, Alice is Swedish and worried that her friends and relatives back home won't be able to pronounce the name Ian. Crouchy, please can you use your pronunciation skills to put my girlfriend's mind at ease? A quick, five fan Ian should do it. Hi, doll. It's Ian. (laughs) (laughs) What, What have you just said? Hello, this is Ian. Ah, so it works. What we're saying is it works in Swedish. So Matthew can pretty much press ahead, Chris. Yeah, I think he can kick on. Really, um, I'm half news. Swedish. Really, I spent three <laughs> months there. Um, I immersed myself in the culture. Um, so my pronunciation should be pretty spot on there. Hi, do Ian. Taksamiki. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> that is massive news for Matthew. But until he does have his first child and until he is confirmed as an Ian, as it stands, boys, I guess that our youngest verified Ian is still nine-year-old Ian from Gordy's family. Is that right? Do you know what, Chris? Um, I think you saw this as well on Twitter. Um, people coming it's up. It's the festival. They, yeah, the festival. <laughs> they, how, how good is These are Ian amazing. Festation? Ian Festation, there's a Glastian Berry, oh, yeah. uh, which Benny I was Cassian. Good. And then, of course, yeah, that's the fave for me. <laughs> Benny, Benny Cassian. Cassian. Well, you think Benny Cassian's better than the Infestation? 
and the infestation. That, that's an absolute belt of renown. <laughs> it's it's so good. <laughs> it's it's mad. But what will it be? Tickle because the, the problem is here. We've already got say Crouchfest or Crouchella mm. or whatever it is we call it. If we just set up Ian Fest, it feels like that would have to be the next festival. I don't know if we just need to make Ian Fest a small tent at what is our festival. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, a small sort of spin off. I just yeah. think we get a little pen of Ian's near the front of the stage, right? So it's just like a little pen where you only get, you have to show your driver's license on entry. You yes. go in near the front, only. front to the side. And if you're called Ian, you just sit in the pen and watch Crouch Fest. Does this go for our famous yeah. Ian's? So Ian Botham's in this pen, is he? Ian Brown? I thought of a well good Ian. Um, Ian Van Dow. You know, Castles in the Sky. You know, oh, tell me why do we build, build castles in the sky? That's a bit of a, that's a banger, isn't it? That, imagine yeah. that, right? Just after Bingo Bango's come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Scenes. Ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba. <laughs> It'll be mad because the crowd, all, all Bango will have to do is walk out on stage and wave, but everyone will celebrate <laughs> like it's... Greatest, like like England have won the World Cup or something. No, there's it's, the it's place, go like... the roof will go off. You know that one where it's a little build up. You know some of the best fighters like Prince of the Zine, people like that. They kept you waiting for a little bit, yeah. And then like just off stage, and all you could hear was bam 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 and then all of a sudden, mate, Bango from Angola, and he's the hero of the hour. Right, boys, you might remember Joel's track that we loved a few episodes ago. Mm. Well, we've been, it was, it went really well that I saw that a lot of people were sending him really nice messages on social media and. Oh, I loved it. It was a really, it's a good track, wasn't it? Really good track. Well, we, we haven't really talked about some of the other songs that we've been getting sent in recently. Um, we've been sort of waiting for something that could really rival that track because it was amazing. And, um, and we should say as well, keep sending in songs uh, for the podcast songs about the podcast because mm. it is great getting a load of them together and i'm sure we'll be able to play out a lot more at some point but boys i've got another one that i'd like to play you um would you like to hear nice. this big time Ooh, exo- exciting well let's give this a whirl this is from arthur palmer let's give it a listen it's the pod you cannot stop no one said it would be a flop yeah it's the pod that's passed along just gets better because they're always back strong gear Never in doubt, there's no debate. The number one, six deep. Peter Crouch and a silly mate. They're having fun, we're all having fun. That podcast, which one? This podcast. That Peter Crouch pod, can't believe that you forgot that podcast. This podcast. That Peter Crouch pod's every week until they stop, but they'll be back stronger. Back stronger. That Peter Crouch pod. Wow. Was. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, boys. What was. What vibes were we getting there, boys? I could, it was a little bit hot chip. Yeah, it was definitely something like it was. An, there was an indie vibe about it. I thought it sounded a bit early Calvin Harris in a weird kind of way. Mm. It was, you know, where Calvin Harris tried to sing like b- b- back then. It was a little bit <laughs> like that. Mm, like acceptable in the eighties days. <laughs> yeah, Good acceptable tune. in the eighties. <laughs> that sort of that sort of thing. I guess the question is really, uh, we we loved the song from Joel a few podcasts back, didn't we? Um, do we think mm. this is kind of taking the number one spot? I got almost, I got quite emotional with Joel's one. You know, like it was quite, it was nice. And I felt something a bit more than I felt this time round. So I will say is that was a great effort, but I feel like Joel is still my number one. What do you think, Chris? I would agree with that. Maybe what we do then, because do you know what? There'll be a lot of people listening to this podcast, maybe for the first time, and this is the episode that you've landed on. Um, so maybe you haven't heard Joel's song before and are wondering why we're wanging on about it. Maybe we just give that one more play so people who haven't heard yeah. it before can hear it. I'm more than happy to hear that tune again. Let's, let's have Joel play us out. Have you ever felt lonely? Have you ever felt sad? Well, I've got the solution for that problem you had. So just take a moment, sit back, back and have bit. no fear. There's three lads chatting for a drink of beer. One used to be professional, big man. big man up top. But it wasn't all just headers. Oh no, he did a lot. Defenders left scared, even though he weren't that fast. 
So go listen to that Peter Crouch podcast Won't write sports for the news To me the best job you could have So why are you here chatting rubbish Is it really all that bad One works as a DJ On national radio So come on Let's get on with the show Well I'm just so happy That my name it isn't Carl <laughs> Cause it would just feel like I've been kicked out of the big fat world of football So let me go down dreaming Oh please just let it last Drifting on to that Peter Crouch podcast Drifting on to that Peter Crouch podcast What a tune That's a tune What a tune that is That actually that is gets better tune. every time you hear it That Peter Crouch podcast From BBC Five Live BBC Sounds Music, radio, podcasts